This is the Journey Inward Podcast with Stephen Jack, moving deep into the minds of unique individuals, learning about their own journey inward and the lessons they learn from this experience we call life. So, welcome to the Journey Inward Podcast. Um, today we've got Phil Scott, who is a manager at Silicon Valley huge tech company. He's also a really nice guy, one of my friends, uh, and world traveler. And probably one of his most famous things is the all, one of the all hail out co-creators. <laughs> Maybe not the most uh, famous thing on there, but uh, something that we've created together. Um, so welcome, Phil. Uh, I suppose one of the first things to ask here is, you know, how we, started the journey of even meeting each other um, and it was probably in one of these rooms here and that was um, kind, kind of strange so I a couple of probably about a month before we met <coughs> I'd been uh, been involved in a car accident uh, somebody had hit the car from behind uh, at quite high speed so I'd hurt my back um, you know got interested in looking around because I was getting quite a lot of back pain through, through that we, we kind of met because I was looking for some help with uh, sort of sorting that out um, and then a, a, a part of that was obviously the meditation and mm. uh, and that aspect of it as well um, and, and it, Had you seen that before, when we did the meditation, the breathing techniques, had you, have you, had you ever um, delved into that side of things before or? Like sort of briefly sort of like 10 minutes like oh that's quite interesting and then you know kind of floated off and looked at something else um but and, and some colleagues of mine had uh, quite into it uh, anyway and they kept saying how you know how much it was helping them with the everyday stresses of life and just just generally something that they enjoyed um so it seemed it seemed to be um you know, it seemed to be a natural fit, you know, we just ended up getting talking about, um, you know, about the, like, sort of all aspects of it, um, and I, I guess the rest is history from there. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, funnily enough, the, you were using a different, I'm not going to name and share it, I mean, <laughs> I would probably be wrong, um, but you were using a different app, and, and it was, my background was in software design and that kind of thing. Um, and, and it was like, you know, by, by chance, I think, we, we were just sort of walking through the call. The calls are this absolutely fantastic film. And, and it was like, why do you use that? Why don't you have your own? Mm. Um, and and I, I guess one thing led to another. Yeah. Um, I think it's like we were actually chatting before this moment about like the joining of expertise in yeah. certain areas. like wouldn't be able to create the app without one another. So um, it was actually quite a, a nice process for, for, for both of us, I think. Um, I've learned a lot um, and, and so have you. It's been a bit of a laugh, lot, lots of uh, strong coffee, um, yes. which is what we usually tend to do when, when we meet up. Um, just had one now, haven't we, as well? Yeah, we've been busy so. Um, I, I, I think it proves that, that there's a lot of things that you can't do alone. Mm. Um, and and part of that is, is knowing, knowing sort of who to talk to for help sometimes and, and where to where to go get it and, and you never know sort of you know sometimes like chance meetings kind of lead to fruitful things mm -hmm. um, and, and a lot of it you know a, a lot of it very much was that it's like I've learned an awful lot that's for certain yeah um, and I think you know well, it was a total chance meeting, wasn't it? Because like, it wouldn't have happened if lockdown didn't occur because you're used to jetting off all yes. over the world. Yeah. Um, obviously based in a uh, concert, uh, uh, yeah. concert um, where, you, where you live, but all over the world. And then lockdown happened, you, en you ended up looking, I don't know how, how you ended up coming to Usher. If you haven't been to Usher Historic Houses, Chapman Gardens, then it's a fantastic place. I don't know how, you found out about it and how actually it ended up you being in here working yourself um i i i think um it was one of those 
looking for some space to go when when lockdowns weren't quite as locked down but you couldn't mingle with people yeah and we ended up ended up here we ended up talking to somebody in a socially distanced way and they kind of mentioned that we were here and, you know you kind of follow your nose from there mm. um and it, again it's, it's something that's built in the you know it, it, it's a product of covid you mm. know and you know I'm, I'm a big believer that not everything is negative mm. you, you yeah. know i've got quite a positive outlook on life um, and i'm a big believer in, in the fact that you know you know sort of sometimes through adversity comes solutions that's uh, quite an interesting thing that you say that because uh, very much similar to me um, and probably probably gets on people's nerves as well as being like look, trying to look at an optimistic um, outlook on everything that's happening obviously covid was um, huge and a lot of um, things happened which weren't very nice for a lot of people even i mean i i experienced it and i was flipping knocked on my backside and i thought i'd be totally fine to be honest with you but I, it, it taught me a lot just that experience but also you know from that that occurring is what were the what were the things that came out of it that you were able to gain from the situation and what did what what did it teach you you know and but i suppose the main question i want to ask you is like do you feel like that optimistic outlook on things is what's taking you from i mean you tell us a little bit about your own story it's about your like your journey is what the podcast is about is you know you where did you start as a young lad i mean you both went to new college Durham, didn't yeah, you? yeah um, and right. where you are now and do you think that optimistic outlook has been like a driving force to get you to where you are at this moment in time um i, I mean i'm I sort of condensing all a little bit but um i grew up in a town called concert uh, some people know it for philly spot crisps uh, but before it was famous for crisps it was famous for steel when i was sort of 10 years old um the the steel works closed right laid off basically the whole town well virtually everybody dad worked in the steel works <coughs> and and sort of going through senior school or comprehensive school or whatever whatever they call them these days um you know it, it was it was one of those things where there wasn't a great deal of optimism around mm. around the town where everybody was basically out of work um but from that you know i was good at some things you know i was good at maths i was this computer thing was quite new at the time um and i you know i probably would have been an architect or something like that had I, sort of followed the original sort of path um but i got enamored by computers and you know chance meetings with various people whilst i was at school it kind of led us down the path of, of you know learning about computers so at school i always used to say wow well, right, i want to make computer games now that as a career for a 13 14 year old kid that as a, a career where there was no college courses nobody really did it for a living um you know it, it was seen to be very uh you know don't be stupid mm. nobody does that i was told that numerous times um so me being me i was quite pig-headed about it and decided that's exactly what i was going to do um and I, I just got better and better at doing it um so i went to college i did a, a computer computers and business course um and then when I when I came out of college, um, you know, you know, just to prove people wrong, within three weeks of finishing college, I was working in, in a little software publisher in the northeast, um, you know, doing what I wanted to do just to prove people wrong. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but that I, I guess that at a, you know, being eighteen years old and and sort of managing effectively to get into doing the thing that you want to do at 18 years old when it was you know if you imagine it's the start of the skyrocket mm. of there was no games industry it was yeah. a, a bunch of people who were making it up as they went along um so you like the, moving into the unknown really and, and yeah and forging a new reality i suppose and and actually you you've had you've been one of the driving forces behind everyone else having these things in the hands and seeing uh, seeing the like an end product of 
even the all hair lap, you know, like yeah. that's an end. Pro that's one of the end products of something of, of this full journey, like a lifetime, isn't it? Really, of your like commitment and work, I suppose. Well, it's like actually it's September now. Uh, it's September first. Well, else we're doing this? Mm -hmm. Um, and as of this month, I've done this being paid every week for doing this kind of thing for 35 years. Yeah. Um, so there, nobody knew at the time, but you know, it's like, you, you kind of, you know, it felt like a worthwhile risk, mm -hmm. right? It's like that risk reward thing yeah. that, that a lot of people don't, you know, a lot of people are very, you know, we've talked about endless cups of coffee about, you know, getting into the uncomfortable. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, it's about challenging yourself, right? Because if, you will have a very boring and unadventurous life if all you do is you sit with the comfort zone. Yeah. Um, you know, you, there, there are times everybody has a different threshold to comfort. I think it's like, you know, and you know, some some people are just it, it's overwhelming the discomfort yeah. that they mm -hmm. get into. Um, whereas I'm quite comfortable in something unknown. Yeah. Sort of, you know, random. But, but I suppose it's like important to like acknowledge as well that that kid that comes from stepping into the discomfort like day after day you know year after year month after month after month and like I always talk with a lot of um, my clients as well as about that bandwidth and exactly what you're saying there is stay within the right bandwidth of, of discomfort now the, only, the play we, if we get, try to like chase comfort, then we end up getting more uncomfortable, which is like, it's a paradox, but the more that we move into our discomfort, the more comfortable we become. So to, that bandwidth of like not going too high, but just coming out of it slightly so that it becomes this new realm. Um, I suppose like a, a question with this one is when you, when you feel like you're moving into that discomfort, what are the, what, what techniques do you use or do you feel like you, you've gone past that point that you're just so used to being in that, out of that, um, in that? I, I, I think sort of modern day I'm quite, like today I'm, I'm probably very comfortable in the, in the unknown. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly when I was younger, um, it, it was a kind of a hybrid of you don't really have much choice. Mm. And, and sort of just having that, you know, being quite rational about, well, other people do this, you know, other people do this all day long. What, you know, what makes you different that you don't do this all day long? Um, you know, I'll, I'll use the example, I, I never, I never went anywhere. You know, holidays for me as a kid were always going to see family down in the South of England. It was never, sort of, um, was never anything far flown. And part of that was because my dad worked away a lot. You know, so to him, a holiday was actually being at home. So it, it was, it was a, um, it, it, it was like for, for us, we, we didn't have holidays in Spain and all that kind of thing. Now, I got to 19 years old and, and there was an opportunity to go to Miami, was the first place I ever went on an aeroplane. Mm -hmm. um, and it was me and a bunch of colleagues. Now, imagine what nine lads who were basically the age between 19 and 21 throwing themselves into the void of which only one of us had ever been that far before mm. uh, basically land upon Miami absolute bunch of idiots right um, but we, we had a, a great experience now we, we survived you know America's still intact um, we came back and then something happened just afterwards, which, which really could have freaked people out, which was the plane that we flew out to America on blew up over Rockaby three weeks later. Wow. Right. So that was a, you know, a bit of a, like, I've got a pic, I actually have a picture of the aeroplane, I took a picture yeah. of the aeroplane before I stepped on it, my first ever aeroplane. So I still have the picture at home somewhere, which is the plane actually intact and everything. And so to see it in pieces lying on a sort of famous shot of the cockpit on its side, that, that was a bit of a, what now, I could have gone, that's it for me, I'm never going to, mm. going to ever go on an aeroplane yeah, yeah. again. Instead, it was a, 
okay, that, that's, that's, my, that's probably increased my odds of actually survival now. Mm. Right? So it's that kind of rationalization, well, that's my dalliance with, with danger in that situation. So I, I've, I've done, you know, I've done that, but I've, since then I've obviously travelled far and wide. Um, you know, I've been to pretty much the four corners of the earth with what I do for a living, plus my own, um, you know, my own sort of, sort of, wanderlust. Yeah, <laughs> sort of wanderlust, that's what yeah. it is, right? Um, you know, I love going to new places. Um, ironically, last week I saw a Norwegian friend um, who... Just come back from Germany. Yeah, just Germany. come back from Germany. I saw a Norwegian friend there who um, very much is of a similar vein. He's about the same age as me. Um, and and he he said this this thing going in, in my mind, which is like he wanted to his his goal in life was to visit a hundred countries. So I saw him for the first time. I've seen him in a few years, obviously with COVID and mm-hmm. lockdowns and stuff. And I asked him how many he was on. He went ninety eight, right? So he and he's travelled a lot for like, I'm yeah. on like fifty something. And he, he's yeah. on ninety eight. So um, I, I I guess it's that that sort of. I'm kind of comfortable with the experience. I'm com- comfortable being in, in somewhere that's like I don't speak the language. I don't I don't necessarily understand the culture, um, because that kind of enriches you. You you learn a lot more. And I, I think if if you can take that into your everyday life and and understand, you know, you think back to some of the most amazing things that you've done on your travels. Mm. You know, wondrous natural stuff you've seen or man-made things that you've seen. You, you can you can kind of take that and, and become you know become a better person yeah i i, I use uh, this exercise called the wheel of life on uh, the meditation course that i take and um, basically it looks at different areas of your life and one of the areas is adventure um, and it's one of those areas actually that i tend to find that most people uh, are lacking now what uh, what I sort of define as an adventure is some form of stepping into the unknown and, and I found that with travelling as well like I, I was in the military for, um, for 10 years but it was, it was, under, it was travelling under control I suppose um, to a certain extent because I was in the military I, was, uh, I had to travel under their terms now when I came out of the military going and doing solo traveling um, was a lot more of a different experience and it was that truly stepping into into the unknown and the amount of things that I've gained from that from the people that you meet the cultures that you interact with um, the the feeling of being out of your depth I suppose and being into that uh, place of discomfort as well was a huge growth spurt for me and I think something that's pushed me on and, and, and that's one of the areas that I find with a lot of people is this they tend to lack that sense of adventure, and I don't know if it don't know if it is sometimes just getting into this uh, monotonous routine of life and, and and getting used to a cycle and feeling that you're under control of everything that's going on that actually stepping out of it seems really alien. But um, I also find find that when I highlight that area or when someone goes up and they've got to fill out how much energy you put in this area, there's not much. So when we come into giving, uh, creating these options together of how they can find a sense of adventure, when they step into them, it almost opens up all the other areas of their life because of even coming back to like, like this, the coming out of the comfort zone again, I find that that's one of the most fruitful things that it does. It makes you think on your feet and pushes you out of a cycle of thinking and living to into a brand new cycle, if you like. Uh, and if, like looking at the world with fresh eyes, I don't know if you, you yeah. sort of feel like that when you travel. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think that some of the, like, you know, some of the, the experiences, right? So like, life is just a bunch of experiences, mm-hmm. right? You know, you come in with, with what you leave with, which is exactly nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, but your experiences and the experiences that you enrich other people with, actually what define you. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm gonna I'm gonna put you on the spot here. So from all your travel experiences, what would you say has been the most influential experience that you've had? Um or just the most memorable experience that you've most had? Most memorable. Um 
I'm on pretty much. I mean, I, I, I think of all the, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll name a couple because I, I can't necessarily name a favourite. Um, you know, sort of being when I, like, where I was born and where I was obsessed with when I was a kid, you know, seeing multiple space shuttles launch, mm. that, that's been a, a major one. That I saw the first one go up after Challenger. Like, which was obviously a, a very monumental thing mm. it was in 1992. Um, being invited into a Buddhist temple randomly in Chiang Mai in Thailand um, and actually just sitting there and, and just absorbing the, the ambience of this mm. place of these people who are totally dedicated to this one thing. Mm -hmm. And, and the, you know, the, being in, just sat there for an hour, uh, like one evening, and just being sat there in this Buddhist temple was was mind blowingly good. Mm. Um, you know, seeing a real Maori haka in New Zealand mm -hmm. is staggering. Yeah. Right. The sheer. It's the, the, there's a real spiritualism to New yeah. Zealand that that you, you can't kind of put into words. The, and the the ethos of the, what the Maori believe in is is so sort of it's really special when you get there and when when you actually get to experience that is is uh it's really dangerous and then then possibly one of the other ones is at the time i wasn't a very good skier um and accidentally ending up on the olympic downhill in which <laughs> was, was quite a one and, and actually being terrified <laughs> but realizing that there's no escape because it's vertical right and literally falling with style um, <laughs> And then somehow managing to get to the bottom and my heart just like, was pounding out of my chest, but realizing that I'd survived. Mm -hmm. And and being a you that's know definitely like, step that's a, that's, that was that's, awesome. that's that's not stepping into the unknown, that's sliding into the <laughs> that, that, that was falling into the unknown. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it, it, it's that sort of like you can fight the flight yeah, kind of yeah. thing. And it was like deal with it. Yeah, right. so that's really, like I suppose like sticking on that fight with the fight or flight and when Come, we keep coming back to this comfort zone, this is where the conversations took us today, but um, is the, it's that point, right, let's just, and um, like even like, trying to link this into the app as well, right, is that fight or flight zone, everyone's experienced it before, when they're in a place of where it's either real danger or perceived danger, okay, so being out into the unknown is a perceived, a lot of the time it's perceived danger for a lot of people, sometimes it is actually danger, that's like, bit of both, <laughs> like survival mode and um, the perceived danger of it as well. So when you're in that, when you're in that place, is, is how do we deal with it and what way do we deal with it? Now, e yeah, uh, coming into something that you probably even unconsciously know about is, and bring it back to the app, is, is the breath. And I've mm -hmm. talked about this and people go, oh, well, being able to step out of the comfort zone, it can't be just as easy as the breath, but actually it's these simple things that can create a switch in the mind and be able to switch it from the fight or flight into that um, parasympathetic nervous system of rest and digest. So when you're, when you're coming into, into this fight or flight realm, you've done diving a lot, right? So you've yeah, done a lot of diving. Yeah. So I can remember when we first went through some of the breathing techniques together, you were yeah. one of the main things that, that I first started with people is that belly breath and yeah. you pretty much had it nailed anyway already, right? Yeah. So I don't know if you in when you're coming into that when you're in that sort of fight or flight realm, you can either let it like the there's two things that are linked to it is like what's your mind doing? Okay, and then also is physiologically what is your body doing? What is your mind doing? If you um, have that optimistic outlook, if you're able to like use logic over emotion a little bit more, which you, I would say that you're a pretty logical guy, yeah. um, and you've got that the tools of the breath as well, then I suppose those two things able to enable you to step into that. I use the fight or flight as a as a friend rather than as a foe. Well, if you take dive as an example, yeah. um, one of the first things that happens is like you are completely and utterly out of your comfort zone when you first start learning to dive. So what happens is, is you get in the water, you can swim, right? Most people can swim. I'm not the 
best swimmer in the world. But I know fine now that I've got a flotation device on and all the other stuff, right? The big bottle of oxygen on my back, I'm gonna float. So when you go under the water the first time, there's a percentage of people who can't even draw a breath out of a like out of a deep mm. thing that you've got in your mouth. There's a percentage of people whose brain goes, you can't breathe underwater, don't be stupid. Right? And they go back up to the surface and they go die and it's not thinking. Right? No matter what they do, their brain will stop them from doing that. The other thing that happens is typically when you get in the water, the first thing you do when you take those first breaths is you'll hyperventilate, mm -hmm. right? Because you'll, oh, like, because you're terrified that you're going to take in water, right? So after a while, what happens is you realise that actually the oxygen's flowing nicely, the the brain's logic kicks in and it mm -hmm. goes, it's okay, you can take a deeper breath. So it, it's like, and you when you dive, you breathe differently. You you have to shallow breathe. Um, mm. But you have to control your breath, you have to look empty your lungs as well as... But you're conscious of it, aren't you? Very you're you're focusing completely so, on, on yeah. you know, you, obviously you're aware of your surroundings, but you're, co you're constantly aware that, that that thing that's in your mouth is what keeps you alive. Yeah, and you're probably, you're most aware of that because of, of where you are. And it's yeah. so weird that you brought that up in terms of that because it just like totally um, gave me a flashback of exactly what um, you say can happen when you're in. I remember, I think it was probably 10, 12 years ago now, I was in Turkey and um, I've never done uh, any diving before. And talking about the fight or flight and breathing here is that I was taken dive, uh, diving by um, someone on a, like an excursion thing and he was in control of my mouthpiece with me next to me. Now, I didn't, I, I wasn't given any signals of what to do when I went down. All I was doing is I got this mouthpiece put in my mouth and we dove quite yeah. far into the water. And my first reaction was that I went into that panic mode, but I couldn't do anything about it yeah. either. So I went into full fight or flight mode. Um, I couldn't do anything about it. I think I tried to actually rip the thing out of my mouth. But then realised I was going to die and did that. So I put it back in my mouth. And then over time, I think it was like, this probably happened in the space of 20 seconds, but I ended up coming into that place of coming into calm with the breath. So I had to figure that out. I mean, in a not a very nice way. But um, it's just really interesting that you got it just flipped me into this thing. And going, yeah. That's exactly what happened to me with the, And that's probably when I didn't, hadn't even explored the breath or thought yeah. about it that much. Yeah, it, it, it's a strange one. It's a, and you get these recurrences of, of like through your life of, mm. where you realise that that actually the, the breath is important, mm. right? It's like you know the so for me dying, um, or just like say when you've been doing um, when you've been doing some kind of sport where you know what one of the one of the ones which I've been fortunate enough to do is is biathlon. Um, uh, it was different to biathlon that most people know because it was summer biathlon, so it was actually mountain bikes and guns rather than skiing and guns. Um, but it was at altitude, it was on the Olympic Olympic course in Utah. And one of the things with if you you kind of stu study what they do with biathlon, they you know the high aer aerobic exercise with the going on the course, mm -hmm. but then they have to bring the breath under control because mm -hmm. they've got to hold the gun and yeah, shoot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you become very aware of trying to trying to calm yourself down mm -hmm. and, and to be able to shoot a gun because if you're doing this constantly, your arms are going up and down as you're trying to hyperventilate. So those are some of the best athletes in the world mm -hmm. at being able to control their heart rate yeah. and breathing. And they're doing it usually at altitude as mm -hmm. well, so there's less oxygen. So they have to be more aware of what's going on mm -hmm. with their breath all the time. And you know, kind of taking that into in the sort of design of, of the OHA lab. Mm -hmm. um, it was, I mean, you, you, we've still got screenshots and stuff of the, of the early stuff, yeah. but the very first thing that we, that we basically designed was the, the, the sort of the breathing pulse yeah. um, and, and how that encouraged you to follow the sort of the, the full length of the breath. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably the only the only app out there that helps you calibrate your breath for something that you feel comfortable yeah. with. Mm -hmm. Right? Now you can actually go a bit further if you move into that discomfort. 
Yeah, um, but it was, it was always designed to have a, a, a natural feel that, that sits with the breath rather than just being a timer. Yeah. Right? Because a, a lot of apps for meditation are actually just they're like an egg timer. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? So it was the, the, the whole point of it was to design something that was very, um, you know, focused on what it was supposed to do yeah. rather than just be a timer. If you notice on the OHL app, there's absolutely no numbers whatsoever during the meditation. Yeah. Right? It's not to, it's not to act like, well, I've got me 15 minutes, so I'm going to meditate. Yeah. So, so you don't look at it and, and, and look at it as a bunch of time. Well, that's, and, and that's what I tend, a lot of people tend to do, don't they? Yep. I mean, I find myself sometimes, even in a meditation, is looking to see how long is left, because we're chasing the future, aren't we? Yep. Whereas actually the OHL app and meditation in its purest form is trying to bring you into the present moment, isn't yep. it? And, and not trying to race forwards, which actually um, creates that sense of feeling that, uh, and, and like it's interesting you're talking about that, with the biathlon is that like being able to like go 100 mile an hour but being able to switch off as well when you want i think that's yeah. one of the arts of meditation that i've found which to retain energy and a lot of people that to usually say to me myself is like how have you got so much energy to do all of these different things that you're doing and it's because i'm not fully stimulated the whole of my life it's i'm deciding when i'm going to turn up the into fifth gear and put the accelerator down but then i'm i'm deciding when i want to switch the engine off as well and and retaining but recharging as well and i, I suppose yeah. like that's what that present moment does and that breath creates that recharge and um, yeah i mean uh, one thing i've learned over the last couple of years partially through doing this mm -hmm. um you know through through sort of learning about meditation um you know, one of the things we established early was um, I had no switch off, mm. right? It was like a million miles an hour, go to sleep. Wake up, million miles an hour, go to sleep. And actually that, that being able to change pace means that if you're able to change pace that when you need to put energy into mm. something, you can actually give a bit of energy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rather than just running on afterburners all the time, suddenly the, you've got nothing more to give. Mm. Um, so being able to sort of separate you know, separate time out for you, separate yeah. time out for you and family. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, what, three, three, four months after we met, uh, my dad died, mm -hmm. right? It was, wasn't expected. It was, it was quite a, you know, it's quite a life changing moment when one of your parents dies. Um, but being able to, there was a lot of other things going on at the, at the same time, right? You know, the whole family was in shock and yeah. everything else. And, but being able to, uh, being able to sort of retain a, a semblance of being able to take, just take that detachment and actually sort of step back from things and go, and, and appreciate what's important, right? You know, there's a classic question of like, what's important and what's urgent, mm -hmm. right? Which is more important, right? It's like, you can have important things that aren't urgent, you can have urgent things that aren't important. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time when something's urgent, it's not actually urgent for you, it's urgent for somebody else. Yeah. Right, so you, you try, it, it kind of teaches to do to do that type of thing. And, you know, I manage a group of people that live in different countries. Like that, that we're all different, we all have different ways of coping with things. Um, and, it, and it's about trying to encourage people to, you know, again, not run on afterburners all the time. It's, you know, it's a dog eat dog world. And a lot of the time, a lot of people don't, you don't get any appreciation, you know, in, in work, in life, whatever, if the exceptional becomes the norm mm. and then something extra is accepted, right? You know, if you run at 100%, you've got nothing more to give, yeah. right? I'm not saying that you slack off and you run at 50%, what I'm saying is, is that you have to be able to have an ebb and a flow yeah. to the energy that you put into things. And, and people actually, what I've found anyway is they're doing the work that I do, is that you have a, 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 a peak performance amount of time during the day, right? And if, for most people, it's two, three hours, mm -hmm. right? Exceptional cases, people can do four or five hours where they're on, 
you know, that going at 100 miles an hour, they're dealing with a lot of things, but they can keep rational, they can keep focused, yeah. right? Once that becomes 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 hours a day, right? That person is just basically running on, running on fumes, yeah. right? And one, once you're running on fumes, your effectiveness diminishes to the point of going down to zero. You may as well switch off, get some time back for yourself, yeah. and actually recharge. And it's, it's the recharge that's important. That's why we spend a third of our life asleep, right? It's because you need to recharge, right? Now, it might not be that you need eight hours sleep a day, but you can take a couple of extra hours for yourself during the day and actually spend some time, you know, whether it be improving, improving your outlook or like getting yourself, you know, new skills or just, just taking yeah. something that you can, you can tangibly go like, actually I feel better today than I did yesterday. Yeah. Um, and there's an interesting thing about sort of like harnessing the present and living in the present while you're looking forward to, you know, there's that expression, oh, I'm looking forward to the holidays. I'm looking forward to Christmas, mm -hmm. right? You're looking forward, you're craving the future. You're basically craving, like say if somebody said, I'm looking forward to Christmas right yeah. now. They're basically looking forward to another four months of their life after yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. Right? I think all the things you can and do. And they place all the happiness in a, in, a, in a future destination rather yeah. than deciding to have it now. And that's, that's probably one of the biggest shifts for me, I don't know if it's the same for you, is going, actually, that's, I remember for years, probably, like, until maybe even seven, six or seven years ago, is that being stuck in that happiness trap of going, when I get, when I get there, I'm going to be happy. And everyone's heard that whole um, happiness trap thing before, but... A lot of people have heard it, but they still do the same things over and over. And actually, that whole present moment, it's not just the breath, okay? But you can even appreciate something like the breath and be grateful. But the simplest things that are around you are the most profound. Like, and, and when, you're, when, when you're moving into the breath, and this I was actually talking to someone today about it, is moving out of psychological time and into like real time, okay, which is in your own body um, and experience that, but also experiencing what's around you. Because we can, we, can, we can be in everyday life and moving around, but we're not actually interacting with it. We're still stuck up here in psychological time. And that's usually a find with a lot of people where they feel like time is 100 miles an hour, um, is people who are stuck here but they're not able to um, focus in on the things around them. As, as soon as you start looking at what is around you, you actually realize that happiness is somewhere where you're at now. And then everything that you do outwardly or in the future, it's like a bit of a bone. It's a bone. It's not that you shouldn't look for things in the future, but it's they're not the thing to be all and end all, and they're not a destination to get to. It's something that you. It's like, I like to call it like life's a playground where you're just playing with this stuff in the future, but it doesn't hold the, it doesn't hold the power for you to have to be happy now, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, I think ultimately it, it's like, enjoy the journey, not the destination. Yeah, right? yeah. It's, it's a great quote, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a, um, for, you know, there's unpleasant things that you can kind of wish out of the day, out of the day you know. Well, let's say, say you've got to go to the dentist tomorrow, right? It's probably not something most people look forward to, right? You'll be happy when that's over, right? Mm -hmm. You're kind of getting over the hurdle of something that's a bit more unpleasant. Um, but it, it, it's a, um, you, you know, the, the, the majority of your learnings come on the journey, not, mm -hmm. not getting there. And it's like, say you're going to climb a big mountain, right? Probably say if somebody climbs Everest, mm -hmm. right? The training, the climb, you know, the, the planning, all the other stuff that goes into it, right? That's where the fulfillment comes, right? The, the moment of standing on the top is just the achievement. Yeah. You look forward to getting to the top, right? It, it's the, I don't believe people climb Everest for the moment that they're on the top. I yeah. People climb Everest for the journey to get there. Yeah, well, that and that's that should be. I think it depends, and we've talked. I've 
I read a lot about the process and the achievement um, process of, of people's drives and and how people who are who are stuck in achievement are, are looking at that end goal, but they're not actually change. They're not. Um, they're they're looking at something that's going to give them that sense of happiness and sense of fulfillment at the end. But actually, like you say, all of the lesson. If you if you um if you have more of a process learning mindset, then you. The end goal, it's not that it's irrelevant, it's just that you're, you're seeing the process as something that you're learning from and growing as an individual. So you, you, you end up enjoying the, the journey rather than having that destination. And then they're the two learning styles that people can have, you know, or, or I suppose drive that they can have is that achievement or process mindset. And I always say to people is, again, is looking at, when you when you finish the day, it's not it's not looking at uh, again into the future of where you want to go, but it's looking what have you learned from your experience today, and then and looking at your small wins because the small wins are bigger than uh, uh, are bigger than that. Uh, there's like multiple small wins that you've had that have, to create a big win. Yeah. And so actually, if you're always looking at people and and, and the day and age you look at is going, oh look what they've achieved. It's like seems unreachable to people, so it ends up like demoralizing them and not actually going towards these things that seem unfathomable. But actually, it's that step by step process and enjoying enjoying that journey um, and understanding that it takes even for you, you know, like it's it's taking you to become a, an expert in your area is is discipline and being and doing the same thing. Um, and being in the same area for 35 years yeah. and that's I think at the moment we're in a day and age where people find it hard to commit to something um, and being stuck on one task because they look too much into the, into the future. Yeah, I, I mean there's a big thing with design and software which is breaking things down into manageable part, mm -hmm. like parts. Um, you, you know, you don't look at something as the, here's the end product, it's a series of lots of little steps. And it's the same way if you if you're training for a marathon, right? You don't immediately go run twenty six miles mm -hmm. when you first start training. You actually save that running twenty six miles. You never run twenty six miles for training for a marathon. In fact, you the only time you run the twenty six miles is the day you run the marathon. Mm -hmm. It's a series of like upping the intensity and mm -hmm. and sort of learning how learning how to run maybe a little bit faster or be more efficient or. You know control your own fitness it's it's like it, it's like all of those types of things that that you do right it, it's not the you, you know it's, it's a series of achievement mm -hmm. like little wins you turn into a runner rather and it becomes part of your being rather than being someone that's run a marathon yeah right so it's like two different things that's what i for myself as a runner is going i don't really the destination sometimes it's i've got a goal but actually is that it's part of me now is that I've run, okay, and yeah. I'm a runner, and and this 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 journey it can take me into long mileage, it can be quick, um, but that's fully solidified within my in my um sense of who I am, if you like. So it, it's quite a it's quite an interesting way to look at it, isn't it? Of like going, am I changing my being as of who I am, am I actually a runner, or have I ran? Have I done something? Okay, have I have I ran a marathon? Yeah. And they're two very different things because you can run a marathon, and then people drop off and fall off the train and they, and they don't run uh, ever again. But actually, for someone who wants to keep that way of life of being able to keep a keep on um, being healthy, then you have to be a runner right and not someone just who's run a marathon that's it's like not a, an end goal it's that journey and carrying it on into into the rest of your life yeah i mean, I'd, I'd, I'd liken it as well to the you're not always in control right so i used to play the clubs uh the, in in various bands right for all i could practice and practice and practice and practice right and you know you get to a point of proficiency you can't account for on the night that the guitar amp blows up. You can't account for the night that you're going to snap a string. You can't account for the night that the singer has a cold and isn't singing particularly well. You can't account for 
I can't they come from the night that somebody in the audience is, is riotous and drunk and they're being a bit, you know, a bit of a pain. You can't account for all of those things. What you get is a bunch of coping mechanisms that go like, okay, I've snapped the string. I need to get another guitar, mm -hmm. right? You have a spare. Do that. You can't account, you know, you have you know that if your amp blows up, you know what plug to pull out to plug in somewhere else that's going to get the sound coming back out of you know, the PA or whatever. It, it's, it's understanding that you have coping mechanisms. You understand that something might and probably will go wrong somewhere during the, the course of what you're doing. Um, but it's a case of like, don't panic, right? It's that, that sort of bringing that inner calm of like, it's okay, I understand this is gonna happen. I understand that, that you know, again, you're not always in control. Anybody that thinks that they're always in control of their own, everything that happens around them, it just doesn't happen, yeah. right? Harking back to those poor souls that were on Panama Model 3. Yeah. Over Lockerbie. Not one of those people were in control of what happened that day. Not one. Mm -hmm. For them, they were on a flight. They were going somewhere that they were look, probably looking forward to. Mm -hmm. um, they weren't in control of any of it. Obviously, very unfortunate what happened. Um, but again, again that, that's the, the, the greater sort of, that's the greater forces at play that, that you know, the, the great weave of time just keeps mm -hmm. on going, right? You, you, you're not going to, you're not always going to be in control. So it's yeah. more about take control of the things that you can take control of, such as more so your own time, more so making space for yourself, yeah. making, you know, being able to do something like, you know, building software under lockdown mm -hmm. with a friend. Yeah. Um, you know, all, the, all of those types of things kind of come into play. Yeah, and the only thing that's constant in life is change, I suppose. So it's like embracing that, that, that we've, everything's changing around us. And like you say, control what you can to create a life that you want, but also be mindful that these things can always change that you've got. Well, I mean, even, even something as simple as, it's like, don't put things off for tomorrow. Mm -hmm. If you if you can and could do them today, yeah. right? Because you just don't know, right? You absolutely don't know. So, you, you know, if somebody's got in their eyes, okay, I'm gonna start a YouTube channel, right? I'm a bit nervous, I'm gonna do it tomorrow. You've got two options in this, right? You start a YouTube channel, channel and you try, and if you get zero views, well, at least you try. If you don't start the YouTube channel, what's going to happen is, I can guarantee you, you'll have zero views, mm -hmm. right? Because nobody ever knew that it existed because it didn't exist, right? So you can either take control of it and actually at least try and, and get in that mindset of like, okay, the, the chances are the first YouTube video that you make is probably going to be garbage. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the learning process. Exactly. Right? Yeah. Whereas, whereas as you get a bit better at it, there's this series of small steps, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think back to the first software I ever wrote and, you know, it was crap, right? But it didn't dissuade us because that process helps you learn how to get better at mm -hmm. doing whatever it is you do. Um, I think uh, that, it's, that's a great way to end the, the podcast, I suppose, is if there's something that you feel like you, you want to try or something that you've, you, you feel a little bit scared to do when you're on, on the fence is just go and do it. The only thing that, you can, that can happen out of that is you, you can, if, if it goes well, great. If it doesn't go as well as you thought, you've learned from it and you can do it better the next time. So yep. um, we'll just we'll wrap up the podcast. That's been really interesting uh, chat as it always is when we, uh, when we meet up for a coffee. Take um, a coffee? Yeah, <laughs> have another one. No, uh, thank you very much, Phil, and um, see you all in the next episode. Cheers. If you want to listen to more podcast episodes, then join the Soul Vision subscription, where you'll gain access to loads of online content to aid you on your journey of self-discovery. Just go to www.lomalvision.com forward slash soulvision. That's www.lomalvision.com 
forward slash soulvision. Thanks so much for listening and good luck on your own unique journey.